that we've been doing for uh, a while now. And uh, remember, we started out by asking the question, what is man's basic problem? Of course, sin is our basic problem, but our basic problem is we are self-willed. We want what we want. God says, I want you to do this, and we, we say, no, I want to do this. We do we disobey the authority that God gives us in our life. Okay? Why do people defy their authority? You know, we talk about the authority that God gives us, uh, parental authority, uh, husband-wife authority, um, job authority, student authority, things like that. And we rebel against authority. We want to do what we want to do. And why do we not just say yes, sir, and obey our, you know, our parents, or why does the wife not say yes, sir, and obey her husband? Why the husbands not say yes, sir, and obey his boss? You know, there's always an argument and trying to get our own way because that's what sin uh, is. It it's, it help, it wants us to have our own way, and so we said, uh, why not? Because there are many things. Number one, we are desire to do what we want to do, and we don't do what our authorities tell us to do because number one, we don't believe God. Adam and Eve, God said not to eat this fruit, and uh, but they wanted to. Eve said, oh, it looks good. I want to eat it. And so she took and ate it in disobedience to God because she didn't really believe God. They would say, oh, God did lie to you. It's really good, and you won't die. He said he lied to Eve, and she believed him and over God. And so she didn't believe God. And so when we uh, don't obey the authorities that God has placed in our life, we, number one, don't do it because we, first of all, really don't believe God. And then second of all, uh, we have a fallen human nature, we, which is in us. We, our heart is wicked, and we want what we want opposed to what God wants. We want uh, our own heart will, uh, the third point is our heart will deceive us. Our heart is deceptive, it is wicked, and it is deceptive. Our heart is wicked and our heart is deceptive. It would deceive us. It would tell us what's good is bad. And will tell us what's bad is good. And our heart will say, oh, God doesn't really this, that, and the other. And it will try to deceive us and tell us to do something that God wants us not to do. Or not do something that God wants us to do. And our heart will deceive us. And not only will our heart deceive us, the world around us will deceive us. You know, the world promotes things as good, which God calls bad. And it normalizes things that God forbids and God is not pleased with. And God calls wickedness. And the world just, oh, it's nothing. It's, you know, it's just a physical act. Have it here. You know, and, and, it, and it will deceive us and try to tell us what God tells us not to do is okay to do. And what God tells us to do is not, we shouldn't do. It will deceive us. The world, so our heart deceives us. The world deceives us. And finally, the devil will deceive us. The devil is a liar. He would deceive us. He would tell us, you know, Adam and Eve, to Eve he came and said, you will not die. God said, if you eat this fruit, you will die. And they said, oh, you won't die. He lied. He's a liar. He will lie to us. He will deceive us, just like the world, just like our flesh. Our flesh will deceive us and our heart will deceive us. He will lie to us and will tell us what is wrong. Bad is good and good is bad. And the world will tell us what is good is bad and bad is good. And the devil will tell us what is bad is good and good is bad will lie to us, will deceive us. So then, what should we do to overcome these problems? Number one, and this is a little bit of review, but we'll pick up where we left. Number one, we must believe God, trust God. We must tell our heart, no. We must tell the world, no. We must tell the flesh, the devil, no. We must believe God over what our heart is telling us. Our heart is trying to deceive us. And so when our heart tells us something's right and God's word says it's not right, we say, no heart, I'm going to choose to believe God. So we must believe God. We choose to believe God over what anybody else is saying. Now, to believe God, we must, not, first of all, know God. Okay? We must know God. <clears throat> we talked about this. This is still review. Uh, we must know God. Um, in Psalm chapter 14, verse 4, and 54, 53, 4 says the same thing. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord? They do not know God? If we're going to believe God, we must know God. How does God reveal himself to us? In his word. In Proverbs chapter 2, and we've talked about this many times, uh, chapter 2, verse 1 through uh, 4 tells us um, that if we do these things, that we should you know, read God's word and 
memorize God's word, meditate on God's word, pray God's word, study God's word. And then it says, then, so if thou wilt, in, if, 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 uh, in verse 1 through verse 4, it's five ifs, and then in verse 5 it says, then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, and out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Okay? If we want to believe God, we must know God. If we want to know God, we must he reveals himself to us in his word, and so we must read his word. We must meditate on his word. Memorize his word. Meditate on his word. Pray his word. Study his word. And then we can know God. And if we know God, and we know his heart toward us, we will have an easier time obeying God. Uh, we will, And then we will love God. If we know God, we will love God. And if we love God, we will obey God. Okay, so... We, we need to love. What are the greatest commands? Jesus said, The greatest command is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Okay, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. You know, thing, all things work together for good that, to them that love God and that are called according to his purpose. And so we know God and then we must love God. John 1, uh, 1 John 4, 9, 4 19 says, uh, We love him because he first loved us. Okay, we understand who God is and his uh, disposition toward us, his love for us. We would love God. First John chapter five verse two says, "By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God we keep His commandments." So loving God and then obeying God, and then trusting God. What is the difference in trusting and we said a while ago? You know, uh, to believe God. What is it? believe in action is trust? Okay, we believe God and we know God and we love God and therefore we do what God tells us. We we can trust God. We have this reliance, we said. We can trust God. God is trustworthy. He will tell me the truth. He will tell me what's best for me. And so I'm going to do what, because I know God, and I know He loves me, and I know who He is, and so I'm going to trust Him. He is trustworthy. Uh, the devil is a father of lies. He's a liar. He's not trustworthy. You shouldn't believe anything the devil says. Of course, he mixes truth with some of the truth with what he says, so that it will uh, fool people into believing in what he's saying is true and it's not, but God is trustworthy. All that God says is true. In first Corinthians, second Corinthians chapter one, verse nine says, But we have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. So we need to not trust ourselves. Our heart will deceive us, our self will deceive us, the world will deceive us, the devil will deceive us. We should trust in any of those. We only should trust in God. God is the only one who's reliable. Whatever God says is true. God cannot lie. He's trustworthy. 1 Timothy 4.10 says, uh, For therefore we both labor and su uh, suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. We trust in the living God. And then 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 70 says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So don't trust your riches. Your riches will deceive you and they'll soon go away and they're not reliable, they're not trustworthy. If you rely upon them, uh, it's like leaning on a sword to stab you in the hand. Okay? It's not trustworthy. You can't lean upon it. Okay? But you can lean upon God and His Word. And then, if we are to uh, believe God, we must recognize that He is in control of everything. He is sovereign. Now, we use that word sovereign to refer sometimes to human rulers, like the Queen of England just passed away, and she was the sovereign you know, queen, and now there's a king, evidently. Um, and those sovereigns are sovereigns of their own, you know. The queen could come here and tell me to do something, I would say, no, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, you're not my authority, you know, I don't have any obligation to obey you. If I was a British person, yeah, but I mean, I'm not. And so your sovereignty ends where your country borders or, or whatever ends, okay? But God has no borders. He is sovereign over everything. There is nothing over which he is not sovereign. And we need to recognize that he's in control of everything. He is sovereign over everything. Right? Uh, Psalm chapter 115, verse 3 says, But our God is in the heavens. He doeth whatsoever he hath pleased. <laughs> okay? How much clearer can you say it? God does whatever he wants to do. And nobody can tell him no. Okay? He is sovereign. He is God. Right, Psalm chapter 135, verse 6 says, Whosoever, whosoever, I'm sorry, whatsoever the Lord pleaseth, that 
is he in heaven and earth and in sea and in deep places? Everywhere that God is sovereign, he's not only sovereign in heaven, just like some human sovereigns are sovereign over their lands. God is sovereign over everything, over every land, every place, every person, every circumstance, every uh, inch of creation he is sovereign over. Uh, Daniel chapter 4 verse 3 says, How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. So not, as, not only is God's sovereignty not limited to any space or place, he's sovereign over every person. He is sovereign over every person in every generation. Okay, He's sovereign over everyone, everywhere, all the time. No matter what, you know, in the past, present, future, he's sovereign over everything. There's nothing uh, un- over which God does not rule. Romans chapter 9, verse 20 says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say unto him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? I, mean, I don't have a right to say, Why, God, why did you do that to me? <laughs> God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to do. We should say, yes, Lord, thank you. I don't know why are you doing it like this, but you are sovereign, you are wise, you are in control, and I trust you. All right? We don't judge God, God judges us. All right? And then recognize he will avenge. You know, we're talking about um, yielding and submitting to authorities that God has placed in our lives. And if your authorities, you know, we sometimes don't like to submit to authority because they're not perfect. No authority is perfect. You know, we can always point to weakness in our authority, you know. If it's our parents, we can say, why should I listen to my parents, you know? They can't even do what they're supposed to do. You know, they argue and they fight, and they don't want me to fight and argue, but they do it themselves, you know. They're not perfect. Yes, God wants you to submit to imperfect authority to show you that he is perfect. He can use even that which is not perfect to accomplish his perfect will if we will submit to him. So we need to recognize that he will avenge. If something's wrong, we let him take care of it. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35 says, uh, To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the thing that shall come upon them uh, make haste. So God will bring things to justice in his time. We don't take upon our our own selves to uh, to take vengeance to somebody did something wrong to me, I'm going to do it back to them. No. Let God take care of that. Somebody might have done you wrong. Okay? And, and, uh, but you need to yield to the authority that God has placed in your life and let God take care of any injustice. In Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Okay? We, can't, we can't take vengeance on ourselves. We can't do something bad to somebody because they did something bad to us. We need to leave it with the Lord. And the same thing in First, Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse eight says, "In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ." So God will bring things to right in the end, and He we need to leave it, leave it with Him. Hebrews chapter ten, verse thirty says, "For we know Him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me; I will recompense, saith the Lord." Again, the Lord should judge his people. So we leave it with the Lord. We need to obey the authorities that God has placed in our life. And then we need to let him take care of any injustice. And then we need to recognize that he has a plan. He knows what he's doing. You know, we all we many times we don't see. We can't understand. We don't see how things in the Bible says. Um, we'll read this verse in a minute, but I'll go ahead and quote it. It says, All things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are called as according to I read that and we'll read it again. But God will bring everything to work together for good. Okay? So we need to recognize He has a plan. He's working. If things are on schedule according to His will. And God does not. And we say, God, what happened? It doesn't seem like you care. It doesn't seem like you're there. It doesn't seem like you, maybe you don't, you know, maybe it seems like that God doesn't have the power. You know, maybe God, you can't think about this. Come on, where are you? You know, no, God has a plan. God has a purpose. God is, is sovereign. He's not forgotten you. He's not unable to aid you. <laughs> you know, he has a purpose in everything that comes to pass in our life. And so we need to trust him. We need to recognize that he has a plan. He knows what he's doing. We don't know what he's doing. 
We don't even know what we're doing, but we can trust him. Say, God, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know how it's going to work together. It doesn't look like it can work together for good to me, but you're sovereign. And God can work, he can work miraculously. Okay, So we trust God. And then Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, it says, Joseph, remember the story? Joseph's uh, brothers uh, treated him wrong when he was young. He you know, the Lord gave him some visions, and he shared that with his brother, and his brother said, why, we're about out here, are you braggadocious, you know, you, and, and so they, they hated him, and when they got an opportunity, they would have killed him, but they sold him to Egypt instead, and uh, then when he got on to Egypt, he was bought by Pharaoh, uh, or Potiphar, and Potiphar's wife abused him, and he was thrown in jail, he didn't do anything wrong, thrown in jail, and then in jail, he, the servant of the Pharaoh, the king, came and he helped them and said, don't forget me. And the guy said, I won't forget you. And he forgot him <laughs> for two years. But finally, you know, God showed what his purpose was in that all at that time. And, and at the end, when Joseph's father died, his brothers came to him and bowed down to him like he said they would years ago. And they said, you know, because he was the second ruler in Egypt, he could have killed him like that. You know, they thought, oh, now our father's dead. He's going to take vengeance on us. He's going to He's going to pay us back for what we did to him. And it means for you. Oh, yeah. He said, what are you talking about? He goes, as for you, you thought it evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people's lives. So Joseph said, you know, I know your purpose was wrong and wicked and you, you meant evil. Okay? But you can't do anything against God's will. You can't do evil. You're, their evil turned into God's good. Okay? God turned their evil. Now, he didn't excuse their evil. Uh, they couldn't say, well, hey, look how it turned out. Oh, we knew it would turn out like that. <laughs> no, they didn't. They meant it for evil, and they were held accountable for that evil for God that they had done. But Joseph said, look, you thought you were doing evil, but God turned what you thought was evil into good, as it is this day. If you hadn't have done that, I wouldn't be here, and I wouldn't be able to save you, and you all would be probably dead because of the famine. You know, it was seven years of famine was to come, and so... He was able to keep his people alive. And God knew that, and he knew that plan. And so Joseph just trusted God. He didn't try to get vengeance. He didn't say, okay, now my father's dead. <laughs> you guys are important. You know, I'm going to pay you back big time. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. He said, look, you meant it for good. Yeah, you did it wrong, and you were, you were intending to do evil. So you're going to have to account to that, you know, for that to God. But... God turned your evil intentions into his plan, a good plan, as it is this day. And so we need to trust God, and we need to say, you know, God can turn whatever anybody else intends for evil to good. We should avenge ourselves, but we should just trust that he has a plan, and he knows what he's doing, and he knows how to bring it to pass. And so we need to trust him and rely upon him. Okay? Deuteronomy 8, chapter 15, uh, verse 15 and 16 says, uh, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, uh, where there was no water, who brought thee uh, forth water out of the rock of Flint, and fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that they might humble that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at the latter end. Okay, so they had went through all sorts of dangers in the wilderness, but it was for their good. It was for their benefit, and God knew that. He had a plan. And when they were going through that, they were, they were murmuring. Israel murmured and complained. Why do we have any of You don't have any water. We don't have any food. We went well. And they are just griping and complaining. God had a plan for them, and he brought to pass the plan, and they got into the land of Israel. But... They should have seen that he had the plan. Okay? And then Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says, For I know that the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, the thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God says, I know what I'm doing. It's, this is going to work out for good. You need to trust me. Okay? And so we need to trust God and we need to understand that he has a plan. He is sovereign. Again, Romans 8, 28, all things, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Okay? And then we must obey God. If we trust, if we believe God, then we must obey God. We must believe God, we must trust God, we must love God, we must know God, love God, and obey God. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 4 says, 
Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. Okay, so we need to obey God. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 20, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God and thou mayest obey his voice and thou mayest cleave unto him for he is thy life and thy length of days that, that thou mayest Dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy father, unto Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, to give them. So we need to obey God. Uh, trust God and then do what God gives us to do. Obey God. In Acts chapter 5, verse 20, And Peter and all the other apostles answered, We ought to obey God rather than men. You know, men were trying to say, Don't you ever preach in that name? And if you preach in that name, we're going to throw you in jail. <laughs> well, whatever. But we're going to obey God. We aren't going to obey you. We're going to obey God. We are not going to violate what God says just because you forbid it. And we are accountable to our God. And not now, God has given each of us authority. Uh, he's given us authority over, you know, somebody authority over us, and he's given us authority over others. But all human authority is limited authority. Okay? God has given parents authority, and the Bible says children obey your parents. Okay, and we need to obey our parents. But we obey them to the extent of the authority that God has given them. They are not sovereign over everything. Okay? If your parents tell you to go kill somebody, you say no. <laughs> because God says, thou shalt not kill. And their authority comes from God. And God didn't give them the authority you know, to tell us to dif disobey God. We cannot disobey God. And so we must obey God. Of course we must obey God. And Paul is not saying, and Peter's not saying here, you know, we're not going to obey you. You can't tell us what to do. We're going to only obey God. No, God has given civil authority authority, has given parents authority, has given teachers authority, has given everybody a certain authority, and we must submit ourselves to that authority over us to the extent of that authority. So we must obey our parents in everything in the Lord. If God doesn't say not to do it and our parents tell us to do it, we must do it. If God says don't do it and our parents tell us to do it, we must say, I'm sorry. You know, the authority that you have been given is given from by God, and God said, don't do that. And so you have no authority to tell me to do that. Okay, but in other matters that God is not, that does not violate God's word, we must obey our authorities. Okay? And then Romans chapter 6, verse 17, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Okay? So we must obey God. And then we must thank God. We must thank God. Do you thank God for everything in your life? You say, well, I thank him for the good things. I think, you know, we get some money and, oh, thank you, God. We get something good. Yes, thank you, God. Something bad happens, you go, why, God? Why? Why? What did you do for? You know, like, no, the Bible says be thankful for everything. It says in Thessalonians chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, in most things, but not everything. No, it says in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus Christ. In everything, whether you think it's good or bad, whatever happens, you may say, thank you, God. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to trust you, to exercise my faith, to strengthen my faith, to be a testament, whatever. We can thank God for the hardships that come into our life. And we should, and that's God's will. There are very few verses that say, this is God's will, you know. Um, all verses Ex, you know, ex, ex, explain God's word will, but it doesn't always say this is God's will in those words. This is this is God's will. Okay, how could you mistake that? And it says in everything give thanks. This is God's will in Christ Jesus concerning you. Say that's what God wants you to do. In everything give thanks. And so when we experience hardship and, and heartache and whatever, we should say God, thank you. I don't know how this is going to work out for good, but I thank you for it. And then Psalm chapter 106, 106 verse 1 says, Praise ye the Lord and give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his mercy endures forever. Okay? So we need to thank the Lord. All right? So those things all reveal that we believe God. If we know God, if we love God, if we obey God, if we're thankful, those things reveal that we believe God. And the second thing we need to do, so number one, we need to believe God. Okay? If we're going to overcome uh, in obeying our authorities and disobeying our authorities, we don't, you know, to in order to obey our authorities, we must first of all, um, we must um, believe God because God told us to. You know, the Bible says, "Children obey your parents." And something when I was young, you know, I didn't want to obey my parents. Sometimes I, you know, thought that I knew more than they did, and maybe I did. I don't know, but I didn't want to obey them. Sometimes, you know, 
I used to say, I want to obey God, but I don't want to obey my parents. <laughs> well, it's not possible because God's the one that said you can obey your parents. And so I can't disobey my parents and be obeying God. If I disobey my parents, I'm disobeying God because God told me to obey my parents. And so uh, we must uh, obey, we must believe God. And then we must obey our authorities. We must submit ourselves to our authorities. To submit, you know, that's not a good word in most people's minds. Submit, that means I got to do what I don't want to do and I have to yield to you and I have to say, I don't want to, but you're my boss, so I'll do it. You know, that's like, oh, I don't want to. That's hard to submit ourselves. And it's hard for children to submit themselves to their parents. You know, they always, I don't want to do what they're saying to do. And they want to say, but, 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 but can I do? And they try to change their mind of their parents and husbands and wives and all the authority down the chain. We, we must submit. And what does that mean? We must yield ourselves. We must say, I don't care what I want. If you want that, then I'm going to do it. Right? We must submit. Now, submit is a in Greek word, uh, hubatasso, means under and place. So put yourself under. Okay? What does that mean? Put yourself under the authority of those that God has placed you over. Submit to them. Say, I'm under you. You tell me what to do, and I'll do it because I'm under you. And you're placing yourself under. God has placed you under there, but you need to uh, submit yourself. You need to put yourself in it. And the, the other word that the Bible uses is to yield. It says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness in, but yield yourselves unto God. As those that are alive with the dead, the members of the instruments of righteousness unto God. So we must yield. We must say, um, It's not about what I want. It's about what God wants and the authority He's placed in my life, directing me through the authorities that He's placed in my life. And so I'm going to obey the authorities that God has given me because I want to obey God and I'm trusting God and I want him to direct me and he directs through authorities. I can't disobey my authorities and be right with God and obey God. You know? uh, James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist. Okay? Submit and resist. Aren't those opposites? Submit says to do what? To put yourself under those that, and then resist means to say no. Okay, we resist those who would oppose any opposition to the authority that God's placed in our life. We must resist. Okay, resist influence against your authorities. You cannot do good if you don't resist bad. You cannot do bad if you don't resist good. Okay, think about that a little bit. Okay, uh, instead of resisting that which is good. We need to resist that which is bad. Now, some people resist that which is good because they want to do what they want to do, and so the authority that tries to get them to do what the authority wants them to do, they resist. They say no, and they're resisting what is good, what God wants, in order to do what they want. Okay? And so they're resisting good, and what they will be doing is bad. And then the opposite is true, too, but we'll look at that in a minute. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 says, No man can serve two masters, for he either will hate the one and love the other, or he will, else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. Okay? You can't serve two masters. You can't do what you want to do and submit to your authorities at the same time. Okay? You must choose. Are you going to do what you want to do and defy your authorities? Or are you going to do what your authorities want you to do and defy yourself? <laughs> you know, And say, you know, shut up to yourself. So you're, you're going to say, shut up to yourself and do what your authority says, or you're going to say, shut up to your authorities and do what you want to do, okay? You can't do it both. Uh, you can't yield to two masters. Uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 51 says, Ye stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. You know? God, uh, these people resist the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was working their heart and directing them, but they didn't want to do they want to do what they want to do. And so they resist the Holy Ghost. They're his direction. I want to do what I want to do. I'm not going to do what the Holy Spirit wants me to do. And they resist the Holy Spirit. Others resist uh, other things. Uh, Romans chapter 12, 13, verse 2 says, Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God, for the, and they that resist shall receive themselves damnation. Okay, so when you resist the authorities that God has placed in your life, you're resisting God. That's what it says. They resist the power of the authority. Resist the ordinance of God. Okay, that's what God has ordained, and you're saying no to your authority, so you're saying no to God, is what it says. And so you're resisting God. You can't resist God and do right. If you're resisting God, then you're doing wrong. Okay. So you can resist good. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 says, Now as Jan Janice and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these resist the truth. 
men of corrupt mind reprobate concerning their faith. Okay? We can resist the truth. The truth is what God reveals in his word, and we can say no. We can refuse. We can resist. We can say no to the truth and do wrong. So, but instead of resisting that which is good, we would need to resist that which is bad. We need to resist. You know, we should resist. But we should resist anything that lifts its head up against the authority that God has placed in our life. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4 says, You have not resisted in the blood, striving against sin. So we must strive against sin and resist. But uh, Hebrews, whoever Paul or whoever Hebrews said, you know, it's not like, you know, you're, you're resisting evil and you're suffering, you know, shed, bloodshed of it. But we need to resist uh, sin. And we need to resist the devil. Verse, uh, James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, but resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So we need to resist the devil. The devil comes to us and wants us to get us to do wrong, and we said, No! We need to resist the devil. If we don't resist the devil, we're resisting God. If we can't resist God, and obey, if we resist God, we're obeying the devil. If we resist the devil, we're obeying, we can obey God. And so we're, we need to resist that which opposes uh, the authority that God places in our life. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfastly in the faith, knowing that the same affliction is accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Okay, so we need to resist the devil. All right, And then, not only do we need to resist that which is wrong, we need to exercise discipline. Okay, Exercise discipline. What's that mean? Tell yourself no. You know, Many people have a hard time telling themselves no. They want it, they want it, and they're not going to tell themselves no. <laughs> but sometimes we just tell ourselves no just because to, make, to show ourselves who's in control. Okay? Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, but I keep under my body. I keep my body under, he's saying, and I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He said, I keep, I suppress my bodily desire. You know, my flesh wants to do this and it wants to do that. I say, no. You know, so I'm slapping it. No, you can't, you know, reach for another cookie. <laughs> no, you know. <laughs> Nope, I'm not going to do that. I'm in control. Your body, you're not in control, you know. So we need to resist and to keep our body, uh, to, to exercise discipline. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, it says, that you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. We need to put off the old man. We need to say no to the old man. And the same thing in Colossians chapter 3. But uh, now ye also put off these things, anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy communication out of your mouth. And then 2 Corinthians 10 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Okay? We can't let our mind uh, rule and have free reign of what to think about or what to do. We need to submit ourselves to what God wants us to think about, what God wants us to do. And we need to re re uh, restrict and resist and, and put down and exercise discipline against our that which opposes what God would have. Okay? And then we didn't need to exercise humility. We need to be humble. Exercise humility. Not humility is the opposite of pride. Matthew 23, verse 12 says, uh, what, uh, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Why? Because God will lift you up. Another verse, James 4, 6 says, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Okay? God will resist you if you are proud, but he will give you grace if you're humble. Okay? So we need to exercise humility. Uh, verse, chapter 4, verse 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Okay? So we need to humble ourselves. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 and 6 says, Likewise, the younger, submit yourself to the older, Yea, all of you be subject one to another, be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may, he may exalt you in due time. Okay? So we need to humble ourselves. We need to not think highly of ourselves. We need to say we are nothing. We are just a servant of God. We just need to do what God wants us to do. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 
Paul gives a testimony. He says, uh, lest I should be exalted above measure, and he's be proud, there, uh, through the abundance of the revelation, you know, God gave Paul a lot of revelation. He, he wrote 13 books in the New Testament. Of the, of the 27, he wrote almost half, 13. Uh, he said, lest I be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. You know, God brought this thorn in the flesh in his life so that he wouldn't become proud, so that we would remain humble. Okay, because God uses and lifts up those who are humble and humbles those who lift themselves up. And so, so he wouldn't lift himself up and say, oh, I wrote 13 <laughs> books in my, you listen to me. God didn't, did you write 13 books in my, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ah, I wrote 13 books in the Bible, you know, you know, lest he be exalted above that which is, and, and not be used of God. And then in verse 8 it says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness, and weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So Paul said, you know, God gave me this, this thorn in the flesh. I don't know what it was. Nobody knows what it was. Uh, but there's something that irritated Paul, and he wanted the Lord to take away. He asked him, prayed three times, Lord, take this away. And the Lord said, no, I gave you that to humble you, to, to make you not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to, so that you will be useless to me. And so when he realized that, he said, I am most gladly, therefore, I glory in my infirmities. He said, thank you, Lord. I, I, I appreciate you giving me this thorn in the flesh, so that I won't be exalted above measure, I won't be ruin my my testimony. And then we need to cast our care upon Him. Okay? We need to cast all our care upon Him. Peter says, "Casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you." Your, your burdens, your care, you cast upon Him. We we can't we can't deal with Him, but we He can. And so we say, "God, here, here's this problem. I leave it with you. You you take care of it." First uh, Peter chapter four verse nineteen says, "Therefore let him that, uh, that suffereth according to the will of God commit." Keeping of his soul to him that that in well doing, uh, as of the faithful creator. Okay, so we just commit ourselves to God. I don't know how I'm. I'm leaving it to you. You do whatever you see is best. Okay? Leave it with God, and then have confidence in God. Okay? Philippians says, being confident of this very thing that He which begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. God will bring us to perfection. God will perfect us. He is perfecting us now, but one day we will be perfect. And He is working in our lives now to bring us to sanctification, and then one day will bring us to complete sanctification. But we need to let Him have His way. Say, God, you work. You know, it's not pleasant sometimes, but this is important, and my sanctification is more important than my comfort. Okay? And then Romans eight twenty eight again. We've read this many times. All things work together for good to them that love God and the heart. All part, and those that are called according to his purpose. Okay? Uh, we read this also. So then don't complain. Okay? Israel constantly was complaining. God was leading them through the wilderness into the land of promise, and they just nothing but complaining, right? We don't have this, we don't have that. Why do we do this? Why do we do that? You know? One time God says, you know, Moses, get out of the way so I can sap these people and I'll start over with you. And Moses says, No, no, Lord, don't do that. Don't do that. Please, please, you know. Have patience with them, you know. And uh but uh, so don't complain. Okay? Philippians chapter two verse fourteen says, "Do all things without murmuring and disputing." And murmuring, complaining, gripe, and dispute. Okay? Uh, Second Peter chapter two verse ten says, uh, "But chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of the un uncleanness and uh, despise governments, presumptuous are they, self-willed." They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. They complain and gripe. The government is this and the government that and that and that. You know? Instead of praying for their government and submitting themselves to their government, they complain and gripe against authorities and that God has placed in their life. And the same thing in Titus chapter 3, verse 2. And speaking evil, speak evil of no man. Be no brawlers, and, but gentle, showing meekness to them. All men. Okay? Speak evil it means complain and gripe against you. Know, that person, he did that and you know, Complaining against especially authorities in life. And then don't worry. Or fret. Okay? The Bible says, don't fret, don't worry. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, and also Luke 12, 25 says, Therefore I say to you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, or what you, you know, or yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat, and body more than raiment? Okay? 
Just don't, don't worry about things. You're worrying about, oh, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? And how am I going to go? Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. You worry, 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 worry. You can't worry and trust God at the same time. Either you're trusting God or you're worrying. If you're worrying, you're not trusting God. So you trust God and not worry. In uh, Philippians chapter 4, be careful for nothing. That doesn't mean don't be cautious, okay? <laughs> it means don't be uh, caring a word about things, okay? Be careful for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You know, pray to God. Don't say, oh, how am I going to do this? Oh, no. I mean, oh, how can I? Oh, oh, oh. You know? <laughs> Why? What's the purpose of that? Just say, God, you know I have this need, and I trust you. You are working out in your time. Thank you, you know? Thanksgiving and supplication, prayer, thank you. Say, thank you, God, for caring for me, loving me. Thank you for bringing this hardship in my life. Now I pray that you will meet this need according to your will. Um, you know, it's like, um, and so we shouldn't worry. You know, it's like I mentioned last week, you know, the, um, we're praying, you know, oh, God, don't let it rain because, please don't let it rain because I got this picnic with my girlfriend and, oh, it's going to be so nice and, you know, don't let it rain, okay? And so I'm praying that, and on Saturday, don't let it rain. And the farmer's over there praying, oh, God, please let it rain because my crops are going to fail. God, please let it rain. You know, so um, God does things according to his will, and he will work it out for good. If it rains, he has other plans that were probably better than what you thought of anyway. So we shouldn't be worried about saying, oh, no, it's going to rain. And I'm going to let it rain. You no, know, don't worry. Careful and then don't fear. Okay, we, we're constantly fearing about the future, fearing about things. How is it going to happen? And what's going to? Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! You know, the Bible says in Luke chapter eight, verse fifty, when Jesus heard it, he answered and said, "Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole." You don't fear. What, what's fear going to do? Why, if you fret and worry and fear, that's not going to do anything. That's not going to do any good. You just trust the Lord. Uh, Luke chapter twelve, verse seven says, uh, "But." Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. You know. Why do you fret and worry and, and be fearful and you know, bite your fingernails off <laughs> worrying and being fearful? God is in control. Trust him. And then Luke chapter 12, verse 3, Jesus, Fear not, little, uh, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay, one of these days you're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ. So don't fear right now. And then John, 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torments, and he that feareth is not made perfect in love. We should love God, not fear. And then finally, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10 says, Fear none of these things which shall ye shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and uh, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days, but be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of righteousness. You don't, don't even fear. We shouldn't even fear if we're facing death. Because death is not the end. Death is not to be feared. Death is the way we get our per perfect condition in heaven and our, condition, our perfect body. Okay, so uh, even if it costs us our life, we shouldn't fear. We should trust God. And then finally, pray. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. Why worry? We should be praying, not fretting. Right? Uh, pray always with all in prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching there into all preservation and supplication for all saints. Uh, Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And then 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayer, intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men. So we need to pray. Okay? In conclusion, finally, what's the conclusion? First of all, believe God. No matter what the circumstances are, believe God. No matter how... What your heart's saying, what your heart, you know, the people heart saying, what the world's saying, what the devil's saying, no matter who's saying what, or what's pulling you in which way, believe God. That was Eve's greatest mistake. She believed the devil instead of believing that she didn't believe God. Okay? Believe God. That says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not to thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Okay? We need to just believe God. All right? And then secondly, Submit to your authorities. Do what your authorities tell you to do. God has given the authorities in your life for a purpose, to direct you. 
to lead you, to guide you, to help you into doing what he wants you to do. And so we need to submit ourselves to the authority. Sometimes we, our authorities are never perfect. No, no authority is perfect. But God uses imperfect authorities to lead us to his perfect will. He uses, uh, even, he uses the weakness of man to glorify him. He uses, like in, in Joseph's case, his brothers hated Joseph. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to do him harm and wrong and wickedness, and they intended to do him wrong, okay? <laughs> but God overrode and used their wickedness to accomplish his purpose and to bless Joseph. So we need to submit ourselves to our authorities. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, that they may, that, and they... And they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So submit ourselves to our authorities. And then finally, God will bless us. If we, if we believe God and submit to ourselves to authority, God will bless us. Trust the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Okay? God will bless us if we will believe him and obey our authorities. So I hope that's an encouragement to you to you know, do what God gives you to do. God has a purpose in giving you authorities in your life. And so if you are a child, you need to obey your parents. Maybe it, you know, it's hard, it's, you don't want to. You need to say, I am going to trust God. I'm going to believe God because he said you obey your parents. And, and that is the first blessing with promise. You know, honor your father and mother. That is, a, uh, that is the first uh, commandment with, with promise. And we must you know, obey our parents. And so we, we must say, I'm going to do what my authorities tell me to do. And then we must, so we believe God and we must obey our authorities. And God will give us the blood and we leave it to God and he'll bless us. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together. We pray that you encourage us this week. Help us to see your hand at work in our lives. And I pray you would help us to believe you and submit ourselves to the authorities that you've given us in our lives. And watch the blessing that you bring upon us. Thank you for your word, in Jesus' name. Amen.